Hi, this is Kane Hodder, better known as Jason from Friday the 13th, Victor Crowley from Hatchet. You are listening to Midnight at the Monster Museum. Keep listening or I'll kill you. Hey, everybody, this is Tom Devlin with Midnight at the Monster Museum, where the nighttime is the fright time. And we are here with another incredible guest. We have she's not a horror scream queen because she kicks ass. She's definitely the dream master. We have Lisa Wilcox from the Nightmare on Elm Street Part 4 and Part 5 as well as many other roles in many other uh, cult classics and, and wonderful films and television. So sit back, enjoy, learn some stuff you might not have known, and let's talk to Lisa Wilcox. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing awesome. Uh, <laughs> Good. And and this is a an awesome call to have because we have a great. We've been announcing it all month, but if they haven't seen it, uh, we are going to have you at our anniversary party to do a a big signing here at the Monster Museum, and that makes us so happy. I uh. am so excited, so excited to. Um, meet and greet people again because <laughs> it's been a little a strange summer and a strange spring you know yeah we actually had you booked for april 3rd and uh and that just went by the wayside as they uh, uh mandated that we locked the doors at the monster museum right around then and uh so we had to push this off and push it off and we talked about doing it on zoom or some kind of digital way and now here we are we get to actually do another in-person signing. Of course, we'll take all social distancing measures into account and keep everybody safe and healthy and happy, but we'll get a chance for all the fans to come out and, and get to meet you. And, and I think that's cool because a lot of the people that we get at a lot of our signings um, are kind of regulars around the area, but you're new, you're new to this area and you, uh, it's going to be really cool because it, it'll be a first for a lot of people. I know it's great, and also it's this, as you can imagine, you know, my entire convention, our entire con, in, you know, convention schedule has been wiped clean, you know. Right. So, so this will be my first opportunity to um, sign autographs and and whatnot um, this year, actually. So I'm really excited. That's that is so cool. We uh we actually met uh, for the very first time here at the Monster Museum. I was hosting a signing um for judith o'day and along comes in alice from from nightmare on Elm street four just <laughs> just walks through the door and uh i knew that you were friends with some friends of mine nick and jim and uh i just didn't i wasn't expecting it and there was a bunch of people in my shop that were here uh that pointed it out right away it was like oh my gosh that's lisa wilcox that's awesome you know and uh it kind of built some hype, but I I had no idea uh, that you were coming that morning, and I thought that was very cool. Um, and when you came, I I just jumped on it and said, "Hey, will you come here and do a signing too?" Uh, and, <laughs> and it all worked out. But um, what what brought you to this point? I mean, let's talk about your career, where it started, where you're from, if you don't mind sharing, and and what kind of got you to the point where you can make a living going to conventions and whatnot? Well, I am originally from Missouri, actually. and Which my, part of Missouri? Uh, the Florida, Columbia. Okay. And, yep, we lived in Columbia, we lived in St. Louis, and we lived in a little town called Washington, Missouri as well. And I spent I spent an immense amount of time in Independence, Missouri, growing oh, up. Oh wow! Um, I used to do work with my uncle in Kansas City, and I had relatives in Independence, so I would see them a lot. Oh, and uh, wow! And then it, later in life, I I did the Trans World conventions for the Halloween World, which is all in St. Louis. So we've done the City Museum and been to St. Louis about a million times. Oh my but, uh, goodness! Well, yeah, very cool. Events. That's so the neat. Show, I still have family there. Yeah, I still the show me stayed. That's right. 
I still have um, some family there, an aunt and uncle. And did you ever get to go to Lake of the Ozarks? Of course, of course. Of I course. did many, many camping trips in Lake of the Ozarks. I went into a place at Lake of the Ozarks that was one of the craziest cafes I ever walked into. It was called the <laughs> Country, Country Kitchen Cafe, all K's. <laughs> KKK, Country Kitchen <laughs> oh, Cafe. God. And I had a blue mohawk. I was probably 14 or 15 years old. And I walked through those doors and it was like deliverance. They just turned their heads real slow. And I was like, Uh-oh. <laughs> I don't know if I should be here. And we left. We ended up leaving. But I, I absolutely adore the Ozarks. We used to go on float trips down there and, and camping and oh, yeah. so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. We had a boat. We had a boat there. Um and we'd sleep on the boat. It was great. And then my aunt and uncle actually left the big city of St. Louis and um, bought a resort, fixed it up, and had that for years right on the lake. So um, lots Very of fond cool. memories, many, many fond memories. Very cool. So, so my father then was offered a, a job he couldn't refuse in Newport Beach, California. So he picked us all up, and we moved to California. And at that point, I had no intention of being an actor at all. I literally fell into it by accident. Wow. A <laughs> um, couple incidents happened. Um, I did do one play in Missouri um, called, well, MASH. Uh, I don't know if you all know that, but MASH is actually a, a Broadway play. Um, and you all probably know the TV show. Of course. Yeah, like so, four, 4077 MASH. Yes, Max. That's, yeah, that, that's I, awesome. Thanks. Yeah, so I played this little role, um, Ms. Randazzle. I had two scenes, and basically it was kind of like a little comic relief scene, and also the scene that we did in front of the um, curtain while they're changing the sets and back. So, um, so just picture Ms. Randazzle. Okay, I've got a pencil skirt, red lipstick, and high high heels. I'm the secretary, and the scene is I'm supposed to go sit on my boss's desk and. Sh- take notes on my steno pad, right? So, um, so I, I'm 400 people out there and I'm walking and one of the footlights <laughs> was not locked, okay? Because the footlights go up to the light, if you need the lighting, if they want the lighting, or down, flat, locked. Well, one of the footlights was not locked and I'm walking and it opens up and my foot goes down into the footlight. Oh, no. Um, center stage. I am literally, uh, my, my high heels are like strappy, dangling off my foot. I'm like trapped. And so, so all these people, so the audience is laughing hysterically. They think this is part of the act. Oh. <laughs> and, I, and, and the guy who plays, who plays the boss, you know, we start doing improv you know, he's like, oh, yeah, well, too much drink there, Ms. Randazzle. Oh, my God. Anyway, backstage, they realize something's going on. Um, Hawkeye sticks his head out, and he helps to unravel me from the the footlight and proceed to do the scene. <laughs> so that was my first experience. I mean, that is a, that's exactly the show must go on uh, yes. mantra. You know, that's, that's theater. That's real. That's, that's right. awesome. That's real theater. And um, yeah. So, so anyway, we get to California and then um, I was really interested in the medical field actually. So, um, but anyway, a friend of mine, of course, you know, like everyone in Southern California, is an actor or a writer or a director or something like that. Um, but I'm a teenager, and my friend says, hey, you want to go with me to Buddy Epson's uh, Theater in Newport? Um, I have an audition. You want to go with me? And I'm like, okay, sure, why not? So I go, and I'm sitting there in the audience watching the auditions. And this lady, the producer, keeps tapping my shoulder saying, are you going to audition? Are you auditioning? I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm just here with a friend. And anyway, she asked me like three times. So finally, I'm like, okay. So I got up. I auditioned, and I got the lead role in Lanford Wilson's play, The Hot Al Baltimore. Wow. And, and was yeah. it just like a cold read, like they gave you a script yes. and you just read off the page? Yes. Yes. Wow. Yes. And um, so I was bitten by the bug. So since that play, I did uh, equity waiver, you know, going to school full-time, high school, and then doing equity waiver plays back to back to back. And then finally, uh, I went to UCLA, have a theater arts degree. And um, six weeks after I graduated from high, um, college, um, I got on the soap opera General Hospital. Oh, awesome. So, 
So that's, and, uh, and it goes on from there. <laughs> that's so cool. And uh, so getting on General Hospital and working in the soap opera industry, I mean, they move fast. That's like, like you're, you're handed a script and you're, you're filming by the end of the week or something, right? It, oh, it is insane. I mean, it, it was great training for me on set, to, you know, to be on a TV set. And, oh, yeah, they move fast. You get one take, and you got to have those lines down, and then you move on to the next scene and the next scene, and and you have just that night to memorize your scenes for the next day. Um, yeah. It's, do you, do you okay. feel like that prepared you for later? I mean, you, you've done some big movies with big budgets and time, uh, but later, you know, getting in back into indie horror or stuff like that, it's very much like soap opera work where you have to move so fast and nobody has time or money for anything. Do you feel yeah. like the, you ever reach back to the soap opera kind of uh, training that you got? Oh, definitely. I mean, that's what I mean, too. I mean, it was great training. Like, you just have to really be on your toes, be prepared for line changes. Um, I think the most, I think the hardest work is, would be soap operas and episodic, because episodic, too, you're working really long hours, and you've got, I mean, it's like doing a mini film, you know? Right, um, right. And the easiest work, I believe, well, I'm is that sitcom work because you have the whole week and you rehearse and rehearse. And then at the end of the day, network comes down and all the writers and producers and you perform and then they're going to make their changes and you'll get changes. But you have plenty of time, you know, and you do it the next day and the next day and the next day. And then finally on Friday, you have your, uh, you know, it's a live studio thing. Well, right. it used to be, used to be. Um, and it was great because it was like opening night, like live theater, you know, so I'd have to say sitcom work was a blast. It's such a blast. But I love doing films too. I mean, I mean certainly the role of like Alice and there's several other roles that are very near and dear to my heart, you know, as far as the story that is portrayed in the film or in certain episodes. So Before getting into how you became a part of the Nightmare franchise, were you at all a horror fan or knew anything about the, the horror world? before that or was that just a role that came up and you were like well yeah I'll go try for it <laughs> um I have been a horror fan vampires bring it on since I was a little girl so awesome. um I was already a fan of Nightmare on Elm Street and I when the opportunity well that's a whole story in itself getting the role of Alice but um um, well, in fact, I'll just say well, my manager let's, let's said. Let's get into that you. story. How how did the, <laughs> the role of Alice come up to you? Especially knowing, I mean, this is part four. Uh, the franchise was huge at that point. Like it wasn't yeah. like, you know, Heather Lennonkamp can say, I got involved in a movie that I didn't know was going to spawn this thing. Yeah. You know, Robert England didn't know that he was going to be a character actor for the rest of his life, you know, and uh and but you you saw them coming you know everybody knew. Nightmare Three was huge yeah so, I love Nightmare Three by the way Dream Warriors yeah that's fantastic um well it's so my my manager so out of out of UCLA and and I did theater there and whatnot and that's how I got a, a manager and then an agent by them seeing my work and um so my manager submitted me said I submitted you for Nightmare on Elm Street four and I'm like oh my god that's so great oh I love the series and then he said, as the month goes by, he said, well, they're not going to see you. I'm like, well, hi. Oh. Said, well, you have to see back then I had the, you know, all the 80s makeup and I had virgin platinum blonde hair. I looked like a cheerleader. Okay. I was, I was a cheerleader. And so when they looked at my headshot, they're like, no, this is not who we see for Alice, right? Um, so anyway, it did, it was about a month and Annette Benson, the casting director of Nightmare on Elm Street series, she told me the story. She said they literally auditioned over 700 actresses and they could not find their Alice. So they went to the reject pile. Hi, Lisa Wilcox in the reject pile. And I finally had the opportunity to audition and I went in with like no make, you know, I read the script and fell in love with the role. Um, went in with like no makeup, dirty hair, you know, I wore my worst color, which is pale yellow. Um, and, and I 
I did it. And I read with Tuesday night and Rennie Harlan, of course, was in the room, the director. And I had one call back on a Friday and I was getting married, 150 people, huge wedding that Sunday. And it was on my honeymoon that I learned that I had booked the role of Alice. That's awesome. That's <laughs> insane. Isn't that uh, insane? I, I know, mean, right? To think that they went through that many people before and then they come back to you and are like, yeah, we'll give her a shot. That's uh, it's pretty awesome. And, yep. and on your honeymoon, you figure out that you got the part. Yes. And in fact, I had to come back early from my honeymoon. Um, and we did the, um, uh, cause they want to do a test shoot and test with lighting and this, and that's when it came up. They said, will you dye your hair? We need you not to be blonde. <laughs> right. So, um, it's kind of and was that a big deal for you back then? Because once again, you know, now it's so normal for people to change their look over and over again. But like, I remember hearing stories of, uh, from other guys I've interviewed about like, oh, they wanted me to have a shaved head. And, you know, to me, mm-hmm. that's not, I would say, yeah, of course, this is for the role. But at the time when they wanted you to dye your hair, was that something that you were like, oh, yeah, no problem? Or were you like, uh, I don't know? No, I was not thrilled with it. Um, so I said, can we do a rinse instead? And they said, okay. Well, the thing is, I may as well have just <laughs> dyed it because the rinse, you know, go home, wash your hair. They had to put the rinse in every single morning, every right. morning. And it was a process. And then they would have two blow dryers on my hair to get my hair dry because it's wet, this, rinse, right. this liquid. Oh, my gosh. And after however many weeks of filming, I think we did nine weeks of filming, um, it stained my hair. I mean, just think of. So you might as well have dyed it. Might as well have dyed it. Exactly. I may as well have dyed it. So anyway, but of course, of course, um, I'm. It was it's perfect for Alice, and and it it was absolutely fine. Yes, I would have done anything. It's crazy because as a you know, I was born in '81, so I grew up with this movie at the right time for my horror fandoms, but uh, but I never would have thought that that was not your real hair color ever. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, nope. And it wasn't until later when I've seen pictures of you with blonde hair that I was like, wow, that's interesting because it looked very natural and uh, it looked great on you. So, no, nope, it worked. It worked. And my mother is actually a redhead. So, okay. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Because uh, you do have the complexion. I mean, in the movie, it's so na- it looks so real. Um, but, yeah. Uh, and it goes with your look and your complexion. But um, so. Once you got the role and you knew you were going to be part of this franchise, did you, un- did you, was there any inkling that like this would be the role people would talk about for the rest of your life? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I had no idea. No, I did not. And, and when doing part four, did you think, did you know you were going to come back for part five? No, no, that happened. Um, well, four came out and it was, you know, a huge box office. Uh, success and whatnot, and that's at that point that they asked me, um, you know, if I would reprise the role of Alice. Yeah. So, um, and I said, sure. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. And yeah. when dealing with it being a huge box office success, had you been in major feature films before this one that kind of like with the big premieres and the big, you know, there was a lot of news in Fangoria and lots of lots of press surrounding this movie. Yes, there was there was and it was like number one for several weeks and right. it just kinda blew everything out of the water and uh and some really big movies came out that summer as well. But we, we really kicked we kicked butt, man. Yeah. Um but yeah, no, it was my first big movie. Um I had done uh General Hospital I had done a Hardcastle McCormick episode. Um, I didn't have a lot on my resume at that point. I had a lot of theater, you know, but yeah. I didn't have a lot of theatrical or TV on my resume. So, yeah, the only movie I had done, and I took a quarter off of school to do it, was uh, it's called um, Give Me an F, which is a fabulous classic 80s T&A movie. <laughs> awesome. Like a teen, teen romp type movie. Yeah. And, yeah. And I was a featured extra. Um, okay. Interesting enough, it was about cheerleaders, four <laughs> groups of cheerleaders. And the group I was part of 
were called the demons. So we have a little foreshadowing of yeah. what I'm going to be doing Nightmare on Elm Street. So once you uh, finished Nightmare and it and it wrapped up and you guys were off to the races, did you find that being part of the franchise helped your career, or did it did it hold you back? Did people think you were now just a horror survivor girl? Oh no, it helped um, immensely. Yeah, it because okay. one being having a lead role, you know, um, and and, and such a recognizable title, you know, everyone's heard of Nightmare on Elm Street. Of course. Um, it opened a lot, it opened a lot of doors for auditions and whatnot. So, um, but then I was doing Nightmare 5 and then um, shortly after that, I, I wanted to have, you know, I was married and wanted to have kids. So, of course, I of took course. A, so my acting took a back seat for quite a while, actually. Um, but, um, yeah. Did you leave L.A. when you decided to have a family? I, I, I left L.A. in 2012 because me and my wife, now girlfriend at the time, were like, all right, it's time to, you know, she was a filmmaker and I was a filmmaker and we wanted to raise kids, but I just couldn't see raising them in L.A. So uh, that's, it took us to Florida and then Florida took us to Nevada and then we found this sleepy little town of Boulder City, which is so ideal for raising kids. Um, mm-hmm. And I, it's close enough where I still keep my fingers in the industry. I actually have a movie that comes out today, uh, oh. but it's uh, called Blade the Iron Cross, which by the time this airs, it'll have already premiered. But oh, there, it's, uh, you know, being in Nevada, I, I'm close enough to the industry to be able to jump back and forth. And I still have a effects shop here in the, at the Monster Museum. But when you wanted to kind of take, that sabbatical from Hollywood, because it is draining and exhausting. I, I can tell you that. Did you leave LA or did you stick around that area? Um, we stayed in the area. And, but again, this was a long time ago. You know, this is, my kids were born, uh, you know, in the early nineties. Okay. So LA um, was, you know, 30 years ago, a lot different than what it is now. Yeah. Um, so, and we were in the Valley. You know, so it was very, you know, darling little school and, and very, uh, you know, suburban. So it, it was fine. It was fine. We were in Studio City. Very so, good. yeah. But nowadays, no way. I mean, I finally made the leap to Nevada because, well, I just, I had decades in L.A. And it's just so congested and so crowded and so yeah. many other things. Um, I was dying to get out for quite a for a number of years but I stayed because my until my children were grown right. and then and of course really everything I do um is out of state I don't need to live in Los Angeles anymore and you know right now additions we do remotely but often I just get offered things you know and uh you know I film in Kentucky and North Carolina and Texas and you know it's rarely rarely film I mean I did commercials and print work and stuff in LA but work is really dried up there so, right. Uh, I feel I feel very similarly. Nowadays, you can you don't have to live in Los Angeles to make it in the movies at all anymore. You know, nope. some of the and I, I think that that's pretty cool. That's one of the benefits of like the online stuff and and things like that. I, I really do feel that it opens the doors for talented people that never made the move. Um, but uh, I so being in in the Valley. I did notice on your, um, I think it was on your IMDb or somewhere I saw that you did an episode or two of Star Trek Next Generation, which I would assume is in the mid-90s-ish? Yeah, mid-90s-ish. I think it was the third season. Um, Yeah, that was spectacular. That is my favorite studio, Paramount. It's absolutely stunning, gorgeous, full of history. Um, and to do a Star Trek, I mean, you cannot believe these sets. The fanfare. Create. You know, and they also yeah. have huge fanfare. So we yeah. see a lot of time. I'm actually not a huge Star Trek fan, but what I love is the crossovers from the horror world that step into Star Trek a lot, like Tony Todd. Um, Ari Mihailov, I think, has done a role on, on Star Trek. Uh, Al Burke. There's a, there is a lot of horror personalities that seemed to end up on Star Trek, Jeffrey Combs. And then, and then that almost makes that fan base look like amplified, you know? So um, I think it's really interesting when I see people, when you were, when you did those days on Star Trek, was that, 
um, were you actively acting still or were you on kind of your break and the opportunity just showed up? Um, I was still auditioning um, there, you know, and uh, so that was a trying to think. I'm, I think my kids were, were my kids born yet. Oh, I think maybe my first one had been born. Um, but it's, uh, you know, I had to do the audition process and, and there were, you know, you go in and the hallways filled with yeah. uh, the LA actresses, <laughs> including Tracy Lords was there. Oh, that's Lourdes. awesome. I know her. I did, a, I did a film with her one time, a sci-fi film. Yeah. She's Princess a very, Lamar. very cool chick. That's so funny because I'm sitting there. She, she comes up to me. She goes, I loved you in Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> That's awesome. She's a huge horror fan too. Big yes, fan. yeah, I see her at conventions occasionally. Um, That's awesome. So that was, but what's really interesting is that that episode, huh, um, I my character Utah um, ended up on the Star Trek Next Generation Monopoly board as a property. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yes, and when you think of the hundreds of guest stars if not yeah. thousands, over the course of that series and to be selected. But I was kind of a, a I'm known as the assassin. I was genetically designed to kill the Turlestas by touch. So so anyway, and I and, and the episode, I get, I'm shocked. Um, Riker and I are falling in love, but then they find out who I am and what I'm trying to do, and he has to phaser me. And, you know, on Star Trek, they don't do a lot of killing, you know. Right. Right. So, um, yeah, so it became sort of a notorious episode, I guess you could say. <laughs> That's very, it's cool to just be part of two franchises that are so well received and, and have such huge fanfare. Um, yeah. I, I think the first horror convention I ever went to, it was in New Jersey, but it was in 1997. Uh, that's when I started and I, I, I kind of, I was, uh, 16 and I just I realized that at that point you could go to conventions and meet stars and and you know it was so cool to see Gunnar Hansen from Texas Chainsaw Massacre and <laughs> Kane Hodder from uh, Friday 13 series who now I work with very closely and I'm very good friends with but as a kid he was a superhero you know uh, and I always I say this a lot on the podcast that uh, there are no comedy conventions where you can go meet Adam Sandler. If there was, my life might have gone in a whole different direction. <laughs> but at 16, to go to a convention and meet Jason Voorhees or that guy that died in Friday the 13th Part 2, Stu Cherno, like just feeling like they were welcoming the public to the other side of the fence where where we, we watch them on TV and the personalities seem so uh, far away. Um how how long until you real? I mean, ninety seven was my first convention, but when did you first realize I can go sit at a table and make people so happy that I get to meet them? I mean, the the phenomena has grown now to the cosplay and and these mega conventions with everybody that you've ever heard of at. But when I started going, it was in like tiny little auditoriums and convention halls or a hotel. And there, there was like maybe 12 or 14 famous people just shaking hands and taking pictures. Mm -hmm. But at what point did you realize like, oh, man, this is, I mean, A, it's kind of a career move. But B, you really do change people's lives when you meet them like that. Uh, I, I mean, it propelled me onto a career path. I've never had a real job in my life. I got out of high school and I started working on x -Files. I drove across country to Hollywood and started working on X-Files. Like my oh, wow. 20 years of being an adult, I've only worked in the film and television industry other than building this museum, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, uh, and it changed my life meeting those guys at the beginning. And it even more so now that I call a lot of them my friends and my colleagues. So how, what, about what time year-wise did you realize this was a thing you could go do? Well, it, it's, Started at uh, Chiller Theater is the first one I did. That was my that was my first convention, Chiller Theater, yeah. 1997. Yep, and I want to say it was probably around then. I mean, I think I've been doing conventions probably for almost 20 years now. Um, nice. So I probably started, you know, in the beginning of them. You know, Chiller was huge, though. I mean, that was Chiller was huge. It was like three floors, yeah. I, I in East Rutherford, New Jersey. 
And, uh, or at least my first one was in East Rutherford. I think they might have moved, but it was at a Marriott. And I was, at, I mean, I didn't even have a driver's license, I don't think, but I got there. I lived in Pennsylvania. And, mm-hmm. um, but those chiller theater shows, they ended up doing them two times a year, but that was after I had moved. I moved in 99 to, to LA, but, um, it was crazy. Like those changed my yeah. life. It, no, it was crazy. I mean, I was like, really? People want my autograph? Okay. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, um, yeah, and it was crazy busy. But, but it's interesting when you say when I go to the conventions, my jaw is dropping and I get, I'm like, oh, my gosh, it's Malcolm McDowell. I love him. Oh, yeah. my God. And then there's, I mean, I'm getting to meet huge <laughs> movie stars that I look up to, you know, and I want their autograph, you know. Right. So, um, and it was a lot of fun, too, because, um I'd go and, of course, you know, there'd be actors that, you know, because my kids are watching TV and films and stuff like that. So I'd get autographs for them. And um, anyway, it's definitely a good time for all. Um, And and what's so wonderful, too, is the stories that I've heard people tell me about how, you know, the character Alice affected their life. And, And I mean, people that are teachers and nurses and all kinds of walks of life, you know. And well, such a strong female character, you know, in an industry where I don't know, you know, it's delicate times and how you phrase things lately, but the horror industry has been bombasted for exploiting women or um, being yes. negative towards women. And I, I never, I can't wrap my mind around it because there's no such thing as a survivor guy. It's always the girl that defeats. Yeah, you know, the the for the most part, I mean, even in Friday yeah. Four, when Tommy Jarvis does defeat Jason, Trish is standing at his side. Yeah, I mean, it's there's um, I feel like females are very strong in horror, both on the villain side when you look at stuff like Sleepaway Camp Two and Three, and on the uh, on the hero side uh, like yourself. So I don't understand why people think that the the women are attacked in in horror so much you know maybe some movies but not most i i think Wes Craven set a precedent with Heather Lennonkamp that she was smart she was uh savvy and she defeated the dream demon that nobody else could mm-hmm. so and and to be one of those characters that you portrayed like you said, uh, I think you said it to me that you weren't a scream queen because you kicked ass. You didn't scream, you know. Right. And I, I, I respect that so much. It's so cool because not a lot of people can say I beat Freddy Krueger, you know. Yeah. And uh, and he is the ultimate. You know, he's campy and funny or whatever. But when you think of the root of Freddy Krueger, he's a terrifying individual. You know. Uh huh. Yes, he is. So he it, did it's evolved into more of a jokester at times still evil of course but um yeah his his personality and what the what they did with this character did evolve over each film honestly and i can totally see how you would influence people like teachers and nurses and women who have taken it upon themselves to uh be superheroes basically because and men, and men. yeah and men. a lot of men, and, and men. many um and i just think that Anybody who steps into a room feeling like, um, I don't know, it, it's one of those things. Having a strong character like that in a film is, uh, and to portray that yourself, it, it's got to be awesome meeting people because there's there has to be those stories where people say, you made me realize I didn't have to back down to a bully. You made me realize mm-hmm. that this or that, you know, and I think that's so cool. I mean, mm-hmm. that that's one of my favorite parts of the conventions because... I would tell these people when I was a kid, like I met Tom Savini when I was 15 or 16 at one of those chiller shows. And I said, I just want to do what you do. Like this, <laughs> how do I do what you do? And he just, you know, he met a hundred thousand kids, but he said something. He said, just go do it, man. And it's like, <laughs> uh, and he was like, you know, go to Hollywood, go to makeup school at Joe Blasco and figure it out. This is before he ever had a school and uh, kind of just like, okay, I will. And I went home and I saved every dollar until I did that, you know, and, mm-hmm. and I didn't waste time. Like I was, I was out there working before most of my class had graduated. Yeah. <laughs> so it, yeah. it was, uh, you know, he, they don't know that, I don't know that the person behind the counter always knows how much um, 
like what you've done for people since you've met them, not just the ones that watched you, but that you're personable and you're kind and the things you've said to people have probably turned screws in their head to make them, you know, succeed even more. Uh, I think conventions are super important to to yeah. those, you know, the horror fans, we are a misfit bunch of awesome people. And that's something that <laughs> we're, we're often misconstrued as people that like sex and violence, but it's not true. You've never met nicer, more personable people than you will at a horror convention, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I, I, I like that I graduated from that class and now, uh, I'm hosting these events and I, I work on the films and stuff that I dreamed of, but, um, I just can't imagine being like in your position to do that role. It's awesome that it was a big deal for you because the amount of people I talked to on the show that, uh, claimed that they weren't really a horror fan and didn't really understand when they took the role. Uh, I talked to, to CJ Graham who played Jason in part six last week. And he said that he goes, I didn't really know. I just kind of lucked into it, you know? And it's like, well, that's a shame because if you would have known, you would have known how cool it was that you had that role. So right, right. The well, fact always- that you enjoyed horror, I think, is is very cool. But then that that role has taken you to where it has, I think that's very cool too. Sorry, I'm over talking. <laughs> but uh, no, no, it's really. It, I think I agree. Conventions are just so powerful um, for everyone, you know. And also, imagine too. It just feels so warm in my heart that you know, I, you know, maybe change someone's life or, you know, um, you know, let have them have inspiration, you know, yeah, so of it's course. a pretty powerful, it's a pretty powerful thing um, to be an actor at all. I'm just, uh, I'm so glad <laughs> that, I, that I did it. How have, how has it affected you through the uh, COVID stuff with when the convention started canceling, because I know you have a pretty full schedule of it usually. How yep. much did you miss out on travel-wise? And was there any big ones that, that went away um, that you were really kind of bummed out about? Oh, my goodness. Yes, 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 yes. Um, very, very bummed out. And, in fact, um, when I go through my calendar still and I see what was written where I was supposed to be that month, that weekend, it makes me cry. It really, I mean, it's just, it's very, very sad. Um, yeah, I missed, gosh, there was one in Salem Horror Fest, and then there was going to be Comic Palooza in Houston, and then, oh my gosh, April was going to be super busy. Book, um, yeah. It was, um, uh, gosh, uh, Steel City, but that one, Steel City, Pittsburgh, that one is still... Um, it's been rescheduled a couple times. It's it's on the calendar for August. So, knock on wood, um, that'll be happening. I was going to go to Canada, um, mostly for the Star Trek stuff. And oh, it's on and on and on. And then um, some movies that I was supposed to do have been postponed. But fortunately, those have been rescheduled for um, in August, uh, October, and September. Is so, there any that you can uh, talk about? Yeah. Um, there's this one, um, it's so, we're going to film in North Carolina in a castle. Oh, cool. Um, it's called Killer Babes and the Frightening Film Fiasco. <laughs> um, awesome. It's really, really fun. Um, I play like a warrior rich, uh, warrior witch. Um, then um, there's one, and I'm trying to think, I'm going to look it up. Um, uh, I'm going to do one here actually in Las Vegas. Oh, cool. Um yes. And um it's a fun uh comedy horror, I would call that one. And then I have I'm reading another script right now. Um they'd like me to do a role in it. And it's um kind of going back to good old eighties slasher, you know, That's horror awesome. film. I awesome. know. So I, I cannot wait to be back on set, believe me. Um, but anyway, this one in Vegas is called Don't Suck. Oh, cool. <laughs> and, uh, so, yeah, there's, you know, um, some stuff. Uh, I have a couple movies that um, I did last year, one called Bloody Man, and actually Tuesday Night is in it. She played, you know, Kristen in Nightmare 4. Of course. Uh, we don't have any scenes together, but we are in the same movie. 
and um, and then I did one in Texas called Mystery Spot, which they're finishing up the editing and all that kind of thing. So anyway, so hopefully there'll be some things that actually come out on the screen, plus being back on set. So um, can you tell us? Can you tell us a little bit about your campaign for Stop the Nightmare? Oh yes, um, Stop the Nightmare. Well, it was it's amazing when COVID hit. You know, um, all the comedians and the clever artists and whatnot doing such like. Okay, did you see the one where my Sharona? He took oh, yeah. my Sharona, <laughs> my yeah. Corona, hysterical, yeah. absolutely hysterical. So, um, and so many just clever things. And I was like, gosh, I really want to, want to do something. I want to do some con- something to contribute to, to lighten the mood, you know? Um, so it was like, I'm like getting ready to go to bed. And I'm like, the, the Freddy jingle comes into my head, you know, one, two, Freddy's coming for you. Yep. And I went, oh, so I rewrote the lyrics for the COVID. <laughs> right. And then um, I called Heather. I said, Heather, I have this idea. I want to do, like, a public service announcement. Here's the lyrics I've done. And she was totally on board. Um, and then I ca- and then I reached out to all my other, you know, actor friends and, and cast member friends and stuff. And uh, whoever was available, they participated. And uh, and that's how it came together. And actually, it, was, it took five different states to make that come <laughs> together. But we were able to do that because of computer and all that stuff, right? Yeah. Um, but um, and we even got Mark Patton in it, and he's in Mexico. And then my friends in Chicago, they um, did the filming of the skits in their neighborhood, all with the protocol, proper protocol. Yeah. Um, it, and then it's just amazing how it even came together, but it did. <laughs> so that's very cool, and you can check it out. I think it's a is it stopthenightmare dot com or what's the what's the it's on YouTube. It's um it's it's hashtag stop the nightmare but also www stop the nightmare twenty twenty dot com twenty twenty that's it mm-hmm. um very cool and it's really fun and and great great little viral video to pass around <laughs> thank uh, you and uh, I saw it on several times I saw it on on the the hashtag hashtag stop the nightmare on the uh, Instagram and uh, mm-hmm. very cool. Um, was everybody, everybody involved was nightmare personalities too. They were all to do with nightmare on Elm street movies. Yes. Yes. From a variety of them, you know, that's very cool. Yeah. Yep. So it and was, it, it's interesting how when everything shut down, a lot of different, uh, factions of people, like you said, the comedians and then you guys, and a lot of people did take that time to get really creative and, uh, mm-hmm. That just shows that nothing will really stop the creativity. We'll keep going, and um, you know, it's just one of those. It's one of those things. There, there's definitely, yeah, no. And when given We're, some time, and and cameras are in our pockets now, there's no reason to not make art. You know. Yes, um, exactly. And as artists, you know, once an artist, always an artist. <laughs> you know, you can't. You just have to be. You have to keep creating. You know, right. in our blood. Do you have anything else coming up you want to plug or chat about? Or if not, I'm uh, my final segment here is what's your favorite scary movie? <laughs> um, gosh, that is such a tough one. Probably Carrie. I love Carrie. I think it's okay. such a great movie. Oh, um, so awesome. Mm-hmm. And I could relate to Carrie, you know, um, as far as, growing up and mean girls really? and all that stuff. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Definitely. Um but I there's so many that I love. <laughs> Very cool. Well, I'm Tom Devlin. This is Lisa Wilcox. Her favorite movie is Carrie. She played a badass in a great franchise and she's out there still doing it. Check out her films. The stuff we talked about on the show, we'll throw some links up as things get uh, released. I will definitely plug it and mention it and till next time next week hope you guys all make it out on july 11th for our three-year anniversary party where you will have lisa wilcox effects artist nick benson and jason himself cj graham here at tom devlin's monster museum boulder city nevada the nighttime is the fright time and this is midnight at the monster museum see you next time